All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, a couple minutes after 1130, so we will get started. Uh, my name is Sean Huber. I'm one of the automation systems group managers here at Rumsey. Thank you for joining us for Rumsey's ongoing webinar series hosted by the Rumsey product specialists. Today, we'll have two specialists tag teaming on a discussion around what control technology is running your plant. Um, as they go through this, you'll see that um, a lot of the services and features that they're talking about are very much oriented towards uh, industrials or end users, people using the technology in their plant. However, there is definitely a piece of this where it still can be beneficial to a systems integrator or an OEM um, in just helping a customer through what their technologies are and all of the aspects and pieces that they may have running a particular production line. So um, also some, some good information in here that, uh, that you could possibly benefit from. So with that, uh, that's kind of all the opening that we have. I will turn it over to you, Dave. All right, thanks, Sean. Good morning, everybody. And thank you all for being here and joining me as we discuss what control technology is running my plant. My name is David Breuer, and today, uh, myself and my partner, Doug, we're gonna go, we're gonna cover an exciting and informative topic. But before we get started, I just wanna go over today's agenda. First, we're gonna do a brief introduction. Next, we're gonna discuss asset lifecycle and critical equipment. Then we're gonna go over the anatomy of an automation assessment, followed by how an automation assessment can help you win. And finally, we're going to take an in-depth look at one of the tools provided by an automation assessment. Yeah, my name is David Breuer. I'm one of the industrial solutions specialists for Rumsey Electric. I've been with Rumsey for just over six months now. And before joining Rumsey, I spent eight years with one of the world's leading cosmetic companies and served in various roles, starting with quality, I spent, uh, some time as an industrial engineer. And then my last role was uh, as a plant engineer. And also during that time, I, I learned, I earned my uh, Lean Six Sigma black belt. And as a doctor, uh, also another industrial solution specialist with David. And I've been in the industrial automation business for about 30 years now. I've been with Rumsey since 2008. And I've been in distribution uh, since 1989 and worked for an OEM prior to that in material handling, servicing Fortune 500s in the military for 10 years prior to that. So uh, glad to be with you today. Thanks, Doug. So let's begin with asset life cycle. When we look at our production floors or utility facilities, we find various pieces of equipment, and they can include motion cells, robotic cells, control cabinets, motors, servos, all kinds of high-tech equipment. And all these pieces of equipment have a certain life cycle or lifespan. And if we want to get a really good look or a good understanding of life cycle, we can use this graph. And this is called the Y build distribution graph, also known as the bathtub curve. So this is primarily found and used in reliability studies. And it's a great tool for understanding, predicting failures within your system. So if you look at the X axis, that's your time. And the Y axis is failure rate. And if we start off on the left side, uh, you can show, or this will show, as a new resource is put in a place, you're highly likely to, to experience failures. And that's because not all machines are dialed in or components aren't dialed in. There may be some tolerances that are missed, maybe raw materials out of conformance, maybe some programming errors, but there's all kinds of things that can lead to initial failures. In the center of the graph, you have your constant failure rate. So Machines running pretty smoothly, very little downtime there. Finally, you get to the right side of the graph, and this is where breakdowns and failures begin. So as the machine ages, equipment gets older, it's not maintained as much, there's excess wear and tear, that sort of thing. Let's just take another look at this, at this left side. So often when a new piece of equipment comes in, we want to protect our investment. So we'll purchase spares of our high tech equipment in order to make sure we don't encounter any high risk failures. Also at that early stage of the new product, it's easier to acquire extra capital to purchase spares. But what ends up happening 
Does the spare sit on the shelf? It'll collect dust, sit in our storeroom. And all this does is just increase uh, inventory carrying costs and it clutters the storeroom. Also, by the time you get to use those spares, they're probably already outdated. And I know I've been there and done that. But as a, a plant engineer or maintenance manager, it's our responsibility to minimize any kind of risk associated with equipment failure. Another thing to look at too is as time goes on, you're not even going to be sure if you have the MRO budget to support the cost of spares down the road. And I'm pretty sure I'm probably not the only one who have experienced something like that. Now let's go over to the other side. So again, this is where machine breaks down a little bit more often. It's probably more than 10 years old. It's well past its payback period. It's off the books in terms of depreciation. This is also the area where you're gonna experience increased breakdowns. And more breakdowns does not necessarily mean you get a brand new machine, especially if the resource is making money, you're gonna to have to keep the thing running. The one issue we wanna look at over here is when you experience a breakdown, there may not be a part available for repair. The original part might be obsolete. Maybe some of you have experienced something like that before. I mean, have you ever gone scouring the internet to try and find a part? And if you did find the part, how bad were you hoping that when it came in, it actually worked? Another thing, last thing we wanna look at over here um, is usually at this point in the life cycle, operations is probably looking to get a little bit more out of the machine than what it's capable of. And over the life cycle, you probably encounter some manpower changes. People retire, you might change jobs, and, you get, and it's getting more and more difficult every year to find skilled labor. So you may be dealing with some training or skills gaps on this side of the graph. So needless to say, it's, it's trying to find the right balance to reduce risk throughout the life cycle of the machine can be a little difficult. Now we're gonna talk about critical equipment. And what I mean by that is any piece of machinery or equipment that can significantly impair operations and quality. So on the screen, you see PLCs, drives, motion controllers. Those are the things that I'm talking about. Having this information at hand is helpful when trying to mitigate risk. Knowing what high-tech parts are in your equipment and having the right parts on hand can help reduce downtime. One thing that's often asked from our maintenance and engineering teams is a record of all the critical equipment, whether it's by QA, safety, finance, corporate engineering. One day, one of those groups are going to ask for that information. And when they do, and you have to go and make sure your list is up to date, make sure it's in the format that the person's asking for, and it's got to be ready as soon as possible. So what ends up happening? You go into your file folder where all kinds of Excel spreadsheets populate. You have to go rifling through, make sure you have the most up-to-date equipment list. And if you don't, now you have to go spend your time to try and pull the tech, your time or technician's time, pull them off the line and go hunting for the right information. And this is not a value-added exercise. Another component of critical equipment is critical spares. Now our parts staff, they do a great job of organizing and maintaining our storerooms. And we usually have a really nice CMMS to, to help us out. But the one thing that can escape even the most organized storeroom is the op obsolescence of parts. And why is this a big deal? Well, again, in the latter part of a machine's life cycle, when the machine goes down, you go dust off that old part, place it in the machine. What happens if the part doesn't work? If the part's obsolete, now we go back on the web again, scouring for a part, and then we're hoping that it still works when it comes in. Or what happens if the new recommended part isn't compatible with the rest of the machine? How valuable would it be if you could have a prioritized list of your highest risk components in the entire facility from a standpoint of availability? I think that'd be pretty useful. For maintenance and engineering teams, we face a lot of challenges when it comes to maintaining our resources. Oftentimes, it requires time, money, and manpower we don't have. Whether, we're, whether it's machine breakdowns, not having the right parts on hand, carrying excess or obsolete parts in your storeroom, not having an accurate list of your critical components on hand, 
we're not being able to quantify where migration dollars should be spent. These are all concerns we face today. So wouldn't you agree that having a tool that can assist in identifying areas to spend capital, improving storeroom efficiency, flagging obsolete equipment, eliminating excess part storage, and a tool that can help calculate ROI, wouldn't that be beneficial for your operation? I think we can all agree that it would be. So this is where we're gonna start talking about the automation assessment. This is a tool that helps focus on machine life cycle and critical equipment. And I really wanna stress that point of data-driven data decisions, as you see here in the definition. If we wanna make smart, calculated, profitable changes, we need to make sure we have the right data to support them. And the automation assessment is that tool. Data that's derived from the automation assessment is fundamental to asset management and life cycle planning. And we're gonna go into this uh, in detail shortly. But I wanna stress that this tool can really help put together strategies for your plant for many years into the future. And I'm not just trying to push off some new product to you. Like I said in the beginning of this webinar, this is an exciting topic. And as a former plant engineer, this would have been an invaluable tool for me. I don't want to speak for anyone else, but I've been around manufacturing enough to know that there's a, lot, there's a lot of asks and not a lot of time to do them, and priorities are always changing. So for the next section of slides, we're going to cover the anatomy of the automation assessment. We're going to look at process flow, the types of technology that are covered in the service levels, development of the plant hierarchy, and finally the deliverables and next steps. So let's focus on the process of an automation assessment. So this is a team-based approach between Rumsey, Rockwell, and you, the customer. And I just wanna show how unobtrusive the process is. So a Rumsey specialist will come and do the data, data collection. One of your technicians may be required to escort the specialist around the facility. But after our team does the on-site data collection, that information is passed off to Rockwell where the data is analyzed and processed, provides several levels of reports and an executive summary, which we're gonna get into in a moment. Next, I wanna take a look at the technology that's covered. And there's two categories of parts, repairable and consumable. And if you're not familiar with them, so repairable would consist of drives, PLCs, HMIs, things like that. And consumables would be breakers, fuses, starters, and throwaway stuff. There's also several levels of service that can be covered and it's that can include Rockwell and other automation brands. So it's not just limited to Rockwell. Now let's take a look at plant hierarchy and why this is such a critical portion of the study. So for many of us, we probably already have a 2D drawing of our plant and that's great for the 30,000 foot view, but we wanna get really detailed why? Well, the more zoomed in we get into our assets, the better it helps identify critical equipment within our facility. And as this graphic builds out, <clears throat> you'll see how the hierarchy delves deeper into your resource. You can start to visualize how the tool can really help you identify the right part at the panel level. But also with this study, at this level of granularity, we'll be able to see the environmental conditions of the panel. We'll see the conditions of the equipment, and we're also gonna be able to see if there's any safety concerns like wiring, arc flash, or lockout tag out. So in summary with the hierarchy, it's, it's the development of an accurate hierarchy that transforms the simple data into the meaningful information, which really is, it's that data driven decisions. So that's what's gonna help support and maintain your, um, your manufacturing plant and your high tech equipment. Any questions so far? Okay. So now we're gonna take a look at the deliverables. And first we're gonna go over the executive summary. Next, Doug is gonna go and he's gonna discuss the fundamental data. And finally, we're gonna take a look at one of the tools that comes with the automation assessment. Now, before we continue, I just wanna get everyone calibrated on some terminology we're gonna see over the next few slides. So if you look at the screen and you go from left to right or green to red, 
you're going to see four terms, and this is related to product lifecycle. So active, which would be your most current offering of a product. Active mature, which is that product still fully supported, but something newer has came out. End of life is going to be something that's discontinued or discontinued date has been announced. And this is where we counsel our customers to begin looking at migrations and last time buys. And then finally, the red is discontinued. And this means the product is no longer manufactured or procured. But something to keep in mind at this point, there may be repair or exchange services available. All right, so let's jump into this executive summary. So this is designed for our, our decision makers to see the high level view and to allow everyone to make more educated asset decisions based on quantified data. So it's just a guide to help make decisions, right? So when we look at this first section here, we're looking at the summary of the part studied. And this shows the magnitude of the investigation. Now, just look over here at this column, that's last column in total parts, and see over 3,500 parts uh, were investigated. And often we find our customers, they tell us they, there's no way they would have the resource to complete a study like this in the time that it's done. And keep in mind, too, our studies usually range anywhere from around 500 to 5,000 parts. Here, what we're looking at is a summary of spares and the total value, value by category. So active, excess active, and inactive. And the key takeaway here is this is the spares that we found in your storeroom with no apparent use. So in other words, it's the spares you have don't match what's in your installed base. Now we're looking at recommended spares. So what do you have in stock? versus what we recommend. So this is looking at what parts we found in your install base, but we didn't find it fine in your inventory. This next slide here, it's probably one of the most critical summary views. What we're looking at is life cycle status of high risk parts per resource. So this is telling you what resource you can think, say all these resources have really high utilization. So what resource has the highest utilization in most discontinued parts. And before I wrap up and because there's one more slide, I uh, just want to summarize. There's three big risk factors that the executive summary presents. And the first one is it's saying, do I have spare parts for the equipment running my production? The second one is asking or saying, what's the current state condition of my parts? Do I have end of life or discontinued parts? And the third, is saying, do I have a combination of the two, which would be the worst case, right? Do I have discontinued parts running my equipment that are not in stock anymore? This is where you can find and run into a huge downtime losses. And so this last slide of, of, of the summary, this is important to mention because it's the overall condition of the panels in the plant. Uh, and again, it's important because it's a high level view but it could also show a safety concern, right? Could you imagine the, the grounding and wiring being all yellow or red? Probably not be, not be a, a good view. Okay, so before we move on, because now we're gonna go into the data part, any questions? Yep, okay. So the next section of the slide, Doug is gonna go over the foundational data. And this is a more static view, but it's important to review before we move on to the last section. Thank you, David. So we just want to review a few reports that are really the key deliverables of the automation assessment process. Uh, the primary objective of reviewing these reports and analyzing them is really to reduce risk in terms of your operations from the standpoint of downtime, obsolescence, and really spare part availability. And so, like my contribution tends to be that with 40 years of looking at industrial control systems, I tend to have some exposure with some of the really old legacy stuff. So I kind of have that ability to overlay that uh, intelligence into the data analysis. So uh, the first slide, David. Uh, first, let's look at this uh, inventory analysis report. I know it's difficult to read the columns here, but uh, this is really a summation of every part number captured in the automation assessment. So is total quantity installed? Uh, is it a recommended spare part? Uh, do you have it in your storeroom? 
And what is its life cycle status, as indicated in the left-hand column there by the uh, four colors? Uh, so by adding the list price column to this report, we can now put a dollar quantitative value on things like the total installed base of Rockwell product in your facility. Uh, we can identify the total value of what's in your storeroom uh, from the Rockwell part standpoint anyway. Uh, we can identify evaluation in terms of insufficient spare parts, critical, what's out there in your plant versus what do we show uh, for recommended spare parts and what's actually in your storeroom. So comparing all of those. And lastly, do you have excess spares, meaning more than what we would typically recommend uh, from a spare part standpoint. So this report really feeds the executive summary data that uh, David had presented earlier. So install base, storeroom value, insufficient parts, and excess spares. Uh, next report we want to take a quick look at. This is a risk by individual asset. So this basically is a bill of material by location down to a specific control panel that was collected in the process. So this is where the hierarchy structure of the data is important. You know, the area, location, the machine, and then finally the panel in that order. And David kind of alluded to that earlier, that the data structure really helps to drill down and give this data meaning to your plant. So here we're looking at the life cycle status of every part number by panel or asset. So how is this really useful? This kind of allows us to assign risk now to specific areas or assets in the plant. So the more yellow and red, obviously the higher the potential risk in the analysis. So uh, next report. So our worst case scenario at Rumsey is a situation where you call in a breakdown situation and we have to say, we're talking to Nitzer or Barber for those of you that know them and our, uh, <clears throat> our <clears throat> excuse me, they really handle all of our service details for emergencies. But I call one of them and they say, sorry, can't get that part, been obsolete for how many years? And geez, is it even repairable any longer? So knowing the life cycle status of each component is what really allows us to evaluate the risk in terms of availability down to each part number. So is it available as an exchange part from Rockwell? I mean, you can get it yeah, the next morning, uh, or is it even really repairable at all? still as a discontinued part. I mean, Rockwell does repair many old parts, but sometimes just can't get components. So looking at the left-hand chart, for example, just a pie chart here, it gives you an overview of the total installed base of all parts by life cycle category. So it's just a high level summary, you know, kind of a general indication of how much discontinued and end of life product you have in your facility. Now the other two reports then allow us to look a little deeper into a specific to a specific location of your plant or down to a specific machine. Again, looking at risk by specific asset. So these tend to be useful when we're looking at migration planning, how much risk exists in a specific area or in this case, a specific machine. Then if you overlay from a plant standpoint, how critical these individual assets are to your production and cash flow, then we can begin to see that this can drive decisions to allocate capital budget dollars uh, during the budget planning process that you go through every year and are required to produce budget uh, requests for. So uh, next one we wanna look at briefly <clears throat> is the life cycle planning worksheet. And I'm going to, I call this the migration planning worksheet. And I think it's really the most important report because what it does is really evaluate the entire database sorted by just discontinued items. So what does that do for it? It really takes all the worst case items, puts them to the top, and then each item is evaluated and prioritized based on the highest risk of availability or potentially how much effort would be needed to replace that specific part if it were to fail. So what do I mean by that? What are some examples? Well, some of the ones that are the highest, or the toughest to deal with and toughest to get 
are, for example, servo motors. They tend to be made to order, customized based on you know, whether the encoder feedback or resolver, et cetera, things like that. Uh, they're usually not sitting on the shelf in exactly the format you may have in your facility. Another one is, is industrial computers because the hardware changes, hard drives, CPUs, you know, obviously faster than other typical industrial components. Now, older operator interface terminals, panel views, for example, you know, sometimes screens aren't available anymore. Uh, older drives, the power components often are no longer available, in some cases, even from a repair standpoint. And then lastly, some items that maybe have uh, proprietary software or programmed items that uh, would be a high degree of engineering to replace them if they were to fail, not just an easy swap of a part or you know, not a plug and chug situation in it, from any standpoint, maybe because of customer proprietary software. So if you look at this you know, little screen in front of us here, this is an example, got some panel views on it, some PLC5 components, uh, an old 160 drive and some SLC modules. So from this standpoint here, PLC5 parts fairly readily available and repairable for sure. But that first panel view on the top there, that's a panel view standard, the oldest panel views that existed. And it's an amber screen that can't even be repaired. There's no available amber screens anywhere, even from a repair standpoint. So bang, that one goes right to the top of the list. Also at the bottom, we see a basic module. Well, what does that basic module really do? That's a program specific to an application type of module. That's one old, difficult to get and would require extracting a program from the old module and getting into the new one to make it functional. So there's an engineering content to swapping out that part. So that one flows to the top as well. <clears throat> so that's, um, so we're looking at key deliverable of this report being that it really helps to prioritize the highest risk components of all the discontinued items. So this is often what will drive decisions then with respect to machines and panels that need migration dollars allocated first. And as David mentioned earlier, this is really what we look at now in terms of true data-driven migration planning that you can submit to management. And because it's based on specific data and facts and part numbers, it may just be easier to help justify funds when you present this kind of information uh, for the budget planning process. And next slide, David. And the last report we want to look at is a quick overview of the spare parts condition report. And this is basically just looking at all the spares we found in, in the storeroom and any stash locations that may have been accumulated into the uh, data gathering. So three basic uh, conditions here we, we look at that are critical. Uh, one, if it's good, that's uh, you know, the best scenario, that's a green box there, that means it's in a sealed box and we know it's still uh, validated as you know, good from the factory or from a repair. Now open box, the seal's broken and maybe it's not in the original box. So really the status isn't 100% known. Could be still good, somebody's open it to inspect it, but we don't know for sure. And then used, that means there's no box. It's obviously been used, may have dust on it, who knows? And again, the status is unknown. So it's not uncommon when we do these uh, assessments to end up in the end from a stash in the storeroom with a pile of parts we don't know the status of, they're really indeterminate. So we do have a solution potentially or a service called inventory assurance. And what that allows us to do is bundle up a box of parts, send it back to Rockwell, and for a fixed fee per part, uh, $300, uh, we can recertify those parts back to guaranteed good condition if they go through the testing process and, and pass. They'd be relabeled and certified as a, a good part. If they are, do not pass, then they automatically go back through the repair process and then get repaired and then certified as new, good, and shipped out in the seal box again. That's called inventory assurance. And that's the, uh, that's the last report we're gonna look at in this uh, brief summation. Awesome, thanks, Doug. So does anyone have any questions about what Doug went over? All right, so we just went through a lot of data there. It's very powerful information. But 
I'm not sure everyone wants to sit and go through Excel spreadsheets and create custom pivot tables. I know for me, I used to do it and, and I still like it, but not everybody wants to do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through the tool that comes with the automation assessment called My Equipment. I'm just gonna click over here. All right, give it a second. Hopefully it pop, populates on everyone's screen. So everything that Doug just went over is now on this software subscription called My Equipment. So in here you see install base evaluation. It's the same thing as automation assessment. Um, and now if you look on the screen, right at the top, you've got your high level overview, your greens to reds, right? Active all the way to discontinued. Even from the hierarchy standpoint, we can go to machine risk analysis. You can go from facility, click here real quick, down to the machine. And if I want to, if you're still a little bit of a data junkie and you wanna go, well, let me just take a, a deeper look there. We can show this as a table. And what do I have on my risk analysis? It's really a Pareto chart, right? So I got my slider here. I can look at all my machines throughout the plant, see what's discontinued or end of life and say, oh, you know what? Capital planning's coming up soon. I need to focus on blenders one through four. And I can come back here. The other nice thing feature too is, and you know, Think about your CMMS system, right? It's a, just a snapshot of what you got. It is not dynamic like this here. Your CMMS is not gonna give you updates on what parts are changing. So just in the last 30 days, oh wow, look at this. I've got six parts that went into life and another six that went discontinued. Let me take a look at my risk analysis over here. And then let's just segue over to product alerts. Again, no Excel spreadsheet or, or CMMS is gonna tell you this. So if you make it part of your weekly or monthly cadence to say, you know what, let me just check my equipment and see if I got any product updates or alerts. And you can see on here, okay, 43 uh, devices could potentially be impact. Now you come down here, it's two devices, but you probably have many of them throughout your plant. And you've got your link to the URL, which I've got right up here. So it goes quick. So I got my notification, my service notification ready to go. I can look it up, see if I got to make any changes or if I'm at risk. I'm going to transition over to the storeroom. And then this is everything that we went over in the executive summary is now right in front of you right here. Recommended spares, your spare part analysis your list, entire list of discontinued parts is all right here, right in front of you. So this is what takes that sta static data, makes it dynamic, easy to use. It's a great tool when you, you wanna do capital planning or look for migration planning. So kind of summarize and, and end this, it, you know, if, as we wrap up, if you find yourself asking questions like, you know, do I have the right spare parts, my critical equipment, uh, life cycle at or near end, where do I need to prioritize capital spending, is the information I have regarding my critical equipment up to date and accurate, well, again, as a former plan engineer, I can say that, that the automation assessment would be the tool that can help you answer all these questions. Thank you very much. And we're open to questions. So Dave, Dave, I'll just hop in here real quick. Um, so when we open this, kind of as the the initial you know conversation, I had mentioned around these tools being a benefit, obviously to the the person or the plant where they're all installed. But from a OEM standpoint, trying to sell a machine into an existing line and knowing what's already there, there's a benefit to this. Uh, from a systems integrator standpoint, knowing what a plant that you have a very good relationship with and knowing what pieces are there and installed and to try and keep you from having those midnight calls that Doug mentioned, looking for the parts that you just can't find anywhere. Um, this is a, this is also a benefit. So it allows you to to do a lot of uh, you know 
coordination with budgeting and, and hopefully keeping you out of those downtime situations or at least as much as possible. I know they will always occur in some way, shape or form, but at least to try and put you in a position to limit them by knowing what's there, what series is there, what uh, you know, product notices as, as uh, David mentioned. Um, and then the, the My Portal, which he had talked about with it being dynamic, um, you know, everything in a spreadsheet's great and it's only a, a, a good, useful tool for that specific minute. Um, however, things do change. Everything is very dynamic in our, in our world uh, with obsolescence and, and issues and things like that that come up on products. Um, it's a way to, to try and keep on top of that without having somebody investing 100% of their time doing nothing but updating spreadsheets. Um, so those are a couple of pieces that you know, I just want to point out as far as the overall automation assessment and benefits of it. So with that, um, definitely open it up to any questions anybody would have um, before we close out. All right. Well, I will ask one of uh, one of you, Dave. So say uh, I did want to um, have an idea, you know, I, I'd like to, to, to get an automation assessment for one of my lines, something that's a very important line for my plant. Uh, how would I, uh, you know, what would be the next steps? So um, thanks, Sean. Uh, actually, the easiest thing to do would just be contact myself or Doug, and uh, we can set up an appointment to discuss it or come out and uh, do your plant and get the ball rolling. All right. Well, with that, no overall questions. You can see Doug's information and David's information is up there. Uh, we will be sending a follow-up email to uh, to this presentation that will have a copy of this presentation as well as this recording and supporting documentation. So if there's uh, any questions that uh, that you have associated with any of this, you'll have everybody's info. Um, with that, uh, continue to uh, look at Rumsey's website. We're going to continue these webinar series on different topics every Tuesday for the foreseeable future and um, you know make sure to sign up for the ones that pertain to you thank you everyone for joining thanks everyone thank you thanks Dave and Doug thanks